Okay, I believe we are now recording. So yes, there's a few spare handouts at the front, but if you haven't managed to get all the handouts, and there were four handouts, four separate handouts in the first lecture, um, they are also all available from the Moodle page for GM11FPM. Hopefully you all know your way around Moodle. Uh, so I won't always bring up this uh, QR mark. So hopefully, if you're going to participate in the polls, uh, you will have bookmarked this by now. And so I won't have to keep giving you the QR mark, which will otherwise keep costing you an extra page. But uh, I've repeated it a few times for you. Um, but do get it bookmarked on your phones uh, when you can or whatever device you're using. Right, and now we're going to start talking about sets and their elements. Now, you can't really give a formal definition of what a set is. It turns out there's problems at the foundations of mathematics, and so I'm not going to attempt to say exactly what is a set, because that's given a lot of trouble. Uh, but we will work with uh, a certain... Uh, We'll start from a certain point. The idea is that a set is something which has in it elements. The elements are some sorts of mathematical objects of a type that we're, we're going to become familiar with. But those elements could be numbers. They could be other sets. They could be all sorts of complicated things that we accept as mathematical objects. And sets can have all sorts of these things in, and some of each kind, you know. Um, but here are some easy examples of sets. And so the, the brackets here show what's inside the set. So you can think of the set as a sort of bag that's got some things in it. Um, and these curly brackets, which we've got at the edges, um, what's between them is in the set. Now, sometimes we'll just list the things. Uh, so if we write 2, 3, 6, that means this set A has got three elements in it, exactly three elements in it, and the three elements in it are the numbers... 2, 3, and 6. So the set A is not the same as any of its elements, um, but it's got three things in it, and we can see what they are. And the set B is a slightly bigger set because it's got 100 things in it. Now, it would take me a long time to write down all 100 things in it, so I take a mathematical shortcut as long as you know exactly what I mean. So in this case, I've got dot, 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 this ellipsis, um, telling you that the obvious pattern continues but stops when you get to 100 because I wrote 100 down and there's nothing after 100. So, so in this one, we stop at 100. But in C, we don't stop. Okay? So in C, it goes 1, 3, 5, 7... Um, and although there are other patterns that would fit that, you might guess, I mean, the odd numbers, um, and so that continues 9, 11, but it doesn't stop, okay? So there's no end. So B's only got 100 elements in, but C's got infinitely many elements in, because I don't stop, and there's infinitely many different odd numbers. You can go as far as you like. So as I say, we're using dots to show that there's a pattern. But using dots when the pattern isn't obvious is not helpful. So I've written down um, pretty much some random, well, these are increasing, but I wrote down some random numbers here, and there's no obvious pattern. Now, you can design a pattern that will fit that, and whichever pattern you design to fit that, you can make a rule that works, and then you can continue that way. But I would suggest that it's not obvious what the pattern is here. Um, it's not obvious what pattern I had in mind. And just because you can find a pattern that fits it doesn't mean that it's the right pattern. So using dots, if the pattern's not clear, is a bad idea. Right? So it's got to be completely obvious to uh, anyone sensible what the pattern is likely to be. And I know that's not a well-defined concept, but uh, that's the idea anyway. So it's not enough that you know what you meant, 
um, the person reading or marking your work needs to know what you meant as well. So if they can't tell, you're not going to get many marks because uh, it wasn't clear enough. And part of, part of what you're going to be learning this year is how to make yourself clear. Um, not just figure out what the answer is, but to explain your reasoning in a clear way so that we can understand your reasoning and that we can see that your reasoning is correct. Um, it's not enough for you to convince yourself, you have to convince us. So there you are. An informal definition has said. It's some sort of collection with some specified mathematical objects in it, and the objects are called elements, or members of the set. Um, and there's a notation we use for this to say whether you are in or not in the set. So it looks a bit like an E, or an epsilon maybe, um, but it isn't. It's, it's the element symbol. Um, and uh, I suppose it may come from some sort of E in the, originally, but uh, this is the is an element symbol, and this is the is not an element symbol. And so if we take that set A we had above, whose elements were 2, 3, and 6, then it's true that 2 is an element of A, and it's also true that 4 is not an element of A, because you look at the list and 4 isn't there. So that's our notation, and we'll be using that a lot. But sometimes we use words, sometimes we use symbols, we'll move between them. You need to get fluent at the notation and symbols, um, and next week I will hand out a standard notation sheet which you're supposed to know. Uh, you won't be taking that notation sheet into the exam with you, so, uh, but it might be helpful during lectures, maybe, um, to have a sheet of notation that you could quickly consult, just in case you can't remember what that funny symbol meant. Right, so, it's time to give you a, a bit of a chance to talk about things. And I'm going to give you two questions to look at. You can look at both of them at the same time, um, because they're rather similar. So I'm going, to, I'm going to stop and pause in a minute in order to let you think about both problem one and problem two. Let me just say they're slightly different. In both problems one and problem two, there are the same two sets, I think, I chose for both, A and B. Um, in problems one and problem two, you're going to be given a statement, and your task is to determine not only why the statement is true or false, but to give a reason for it as well. And basically, I've given you four answers. Um, there'll be two trues and two falses, and of course, only one of the true or false will be correct. But also, for each true or each false, uh, for the one that is right, of the true or false, there are two reasons. The one of the reasons is right, and one of the reasons is wrong. Um, and this is relatively easy um, logical thinking. Um, I normally use questions a bit like these two um, as easy starters when it comes to the class test to make sure everybody gets a few marks. Okay, so uh, these, these questions, or questions rather like them, are likely to come up on the class test to make sure everybody gets the first few marks without any problems. Hopefully. Right, okay. So, the first question is, you have to think about is, every element of A is also an element of B. You've got to decide whether it's true or false, and you have to come out with... Okay, and, and there may be more than one correct reason, but I've only... Whatever the correct reasons available are, I've only listed one correct reason and one correct answer. So, so that's going to be problem one. That's going to be deciding whether or not it's true that every element of A is also an element of B. Uh, problem two is exactly the same. <coughs> Sets A and B, again, four possible reasons. Um, also a chance to ask me to explain the question again and so on. Uh, but this time, the statement is different. The statement is, there is at least one element of A, which is also an element of B. And you've got various possible true or false answers with various possible bits of reasoning. So talk to each other about problems one and two. Try to persuade your neighbour that you've got it right. Um, um, only uh, we'll be voting on problem one. Remember, after the vote on problem one, uh, I'll give you time to think about it. Um, then we'll have a vote on problem one. Then you have to give me time to uh, delete all the responses so that we can vote on problem two. Okay. So now talk about yourselves about problems one and two.
and I'll show you. Let's see, we got. Okay, 289 responses so far, and there's about 220 registered for the class. It may be that some people have voted twice. I don't mind. You can vote as many times as you like, but uh, um, this is completely informal to give you a rough idea. But as you can see, there's a big majority in favour of D. Um, we do have uh, some variety in responses, but it does look like D is the most popular. Um, in fact, indeed, there are more votes for D than there are people registered for the class. So... Uh, so it's a big winner, and it is correct. Okay, so I do want to say a tiny bit about this, right? So the first thing I want to say is this: this is a general principle of logic. Here, if we got a statement of the form every element of A has some property, now you cannot demonstrate such a statement to be true by finding an example unless A only has one element, okay? If A only had one element, then you could find that that element had the right property and you'd be okay. But since you're being asked whether something's true for every element of A, it's no good finding one element of A that has that property. Um, so true because one is an example is no good, tr because it isn't even an example. Uh, true because three is an example is no good because... You have to check all the elements of A in order to check whether something's true for every element of A. Okay? So, um, both of those are wrong. The false because 7 is a counterexample is wrong because um, to, be a to find a counterexample here, you need to find something that's in A and isn't in B. So, you're looking for something that's in A and isn't in B to demonstrate that this, there's at least one element of A where it's false. Okay? So we're looking for one counterexample here, and we get it by looking at the number one. The number one, which is in A and isn't in B, so therefore gives you a counterexample to the statement that everything in A is also in B. Okay, so that's that one. Now, don't vote on problem two till I've zeroed the, uh, zeroed the numbers here. Okay, I've deleted the responses, so you can now vote whenever you like on problem two, but I'm going to give you another, just another couple of minutes, now that we've had problem one, to think about this one, because it's a slightly different problem. So I'll just give you another couple of minutes and see what you come up with on problem two. Meanwhile, I'll keep an eye on, on what your votes are. So talk amongst yourselves again for another minute or two. And hopefully you'll be just as clear about this one as you were about the last one. <coughs> so I'll just show you what we've what we now have on the voting side, and perhaps I can get rid of that as well. I'll get rid of that. Right. Okay, so 307 responses, I see. Um, with a big majority of flavor of A, we've got. Um, about 10%, 9 or 10% asking me uh, to, to explain the question again. Um, I think I'll, I'll have to do that as, as I explain the answer. Right, so the correct answer is indeed A, as most of you voted for. Um, now, there is at least one element with a property. This time... You can prove it true by finding one where it works, and you can't prove it false by finding one where it doesn't work. Um, because for this one to be true, you only have to find one element of A that works. So the big difference between for every 
and there is, or there exists, the big difference between them is what you need to do in order to establish the truth or falsity of the statement. So this time, because it's a there is one, you only have to find one to prove it true. So this time you see that 3 is an element of A, which is also an element of B. So since 3 is an element of A, which is also an element of B, that example shows that there is at least one. For example, 3. So the correct answer is A. Um, C is no good because 1 isn't an example, because 1 is in A, but 1 isn't in B. B is no good, first of all, because the statement is true, not false. So you know you've had it. But if you look at 7, um, well, it's OK. 7 is in B and is not in A, so it's not really very helpful at all. And if we look at 1, 1 is in A, but it's not in B. But that isn't conclusive, because although 1 doesn't work, 3 does. So what happens here is that some of the elements of A are in B and some of the elements of A aren't in B. You only have to find one element of A that is in B and then you proved it true. So big majority got those right. There were a number of other responses. So if you didn't get that right, have a think about what the logic is behind these questions because although it's very easy and the simple and the basic start of the logic, that logic comes through and is needed in all of the rest of mathematics. The difference between there is and for all is absolutely crucial. And uh, I have to say, in marking previous year's exams, um, under exam panic conditions, a lot of people will switch from one to the other, and when asked a question about there is, will answer the question as if I said for all, or when asked a question about for all, will answer the question as if I said there is in a more complicated setting. So you've got to get the basics right, and then you've got to use it later, in all the math later. Otherwise, if it's not, if it's not solid now, then it, it's not going to be solid when you answer exam questions. Right. OK, so moving on. Let's have a look at some examples of sets of numbers. So, yes, we're using these curly braces, these curly brackets, uh, to indicate that we're defining a set, but there are lots of other ways to define sets. We could use words, we can give various ways of defining them, um, but we've got to be clear. Whatever we do has got to be clear. Um, if, you, you, if you're ambiguous, then I won't know which set you mean, and then I won't be able to tell whether you got it right or wrong. And if I can't tell if you got it right or wrong, that means you got it wrong. Uh, okay? There may be some occasions when... Uh, you've just got an obvious typo and I know you really meant to write this. But you can't rely on that. Um, if what you write doesn't make any sense, and if I really don't know what you meant, then that counts as getting it wrong. So you've got to be clear, okay? Right, now, so what have we got? The set of all real numbers, I claim to be clear, actually, what the set of real numbers is. There's, again, a whole load of formalism at the basis but we're, of maths, but... Our starting point here at the course of Nottingham is that you know about the real number line and all the points and the real numbers. And there's a lot of different kinds of real numbers, um, including integers and fractions and, and things like square root of 2, which are going to turn out not to be rational numbers and things like that. Um, but we're going to assume that you do know about the real number line. The x-axis has points on it, one point for every real number line, uh, one for every real number. Okay. Then we've got Z. Oh, these are the funny symbols. These are called blackboard bold. That font is called blackboard bold. Um, distinguishes it from the usual kind of R, the usual kind of Z. Um, we normally use these blackboard bold with a sort of uh, hollow white bit in the middle um, to indicate that it's a set, uh, a special named set that will meet a lot. And you need to know what these notation means and not get confused between them because... If I ask you a question about one of these sets and you think it's a different set, then you're going to get the answer wrong. So, again, notation is important. Z, then, the set of all integers, positive, negative, or zero. So that's got things, that's got minus two, minus five, minus one, naught, three, seven, all those things, all those whole numbers, except that they can be negative or zero as well. Okay. Um, now... So what is the natural numbers, this blackboard N? Well, 
If you look in the literature, look in the books, it's about a 50-50 split in the literature, and depending on what kind of mathematician you are, you may prefer one to the other. The question is whether naught counts. Um, at Nottingham, I think most people won't include naught, but if you go to other places and look at various books, you might. So make sure, whichever module you're doing, that you know whether naught is included in your natural numbers. But in this module, it's the strictly positive integers. Moreover, if I say positive, I mean strictly positive. Um, if I don't mean strictly positive, I'm going to use the term non-negative. And if I say negative, I'm going to mean strictly negative. So uh, there's all these things to distinguish. The positive integers, that's the strictly positive integers, go one, two, three, and never ending, carrying on, never stopping, and there's no biggest one. There's no integer infinity. Um, whatever integer you give me, I can add one to it, and that gives you another integer. Um, these positive integers, they don't stop. Okay, so the rational numbers, these are basically the fractions, but they don't have to be between 0 and 1. Um, I need to divide two integers, but I mustn't divide by 0. So what I insist on is, uh, when I'm defining rational numbers, and every rational number can be defined in lots of different ways, but the things that count as rational numbers are the things you get by dividing a integer, an integer m, which could be zero or negative, by a strictly positive integer m. So I've insisted m is greater than naught, so m is a natural number here. Now that doesn't mean to say that you can't get rational numbers in other ways. If you divide minus two by minus three, you'll actually get two thirds, which is still a rational number, um, but you just got at it in a different way. So what I'm saying is these numbers are rational numbers, and all rational numbers can be written in this way, and rational numbers can also be written in other ways. You can get at them other ways, but um, the only things that will count as rational numbers for us are these numbers. Um, so anything you can't get at this way is not a rational number. But it's basically the fractions, positive, negative, or zero, um, and you can go over one. Um, I don't insist on them being sort of proper fractions. Right. And the empty set. There's a very special set. Um, the empty set has no elements at all, and if you want, one of my research students used to write it like this. And I think that's perfectly fine. Um, it's the set with no elements at all. Okay? The set itself <coughs> is a perfectly good thing. Um, and you can make a set which has got the empty set in it, because sets can have sets in them, and if you put the empty set in a set, then the, biggest, the set which has got the empty set in is not empty. So this set is not empty. This is a set which has got one element in, and the element in it is the empty set. That element is a set which has no elements in it, but that's different. Okay, so count the elements. There's no elements in here. There's one element in here, and that causes a lot of trouble. Okay, but uh, if see if you can figure out the difference between those two sets, because one of them's got no elements in, and the other one's got one element in. But the element that's in it happens to be a funny object, the empty set. But the empty set is an aimed object, and it's one thing. Right. Okay. What else can you do? Here are some more ways to define sets. Um, you can use symbols in various ways. And now what's going on here? Let's try and explain it. Um, these sets have got braces again. And in the middle, somewhere, there's either a vertical line, like that, or a colon, like that. Um, and those separate two essentially different parts of what you're doing when you're defining this set. The first bit says something about what's going to be in the set. Um, often, the first part tells you all the things that could conceivably be in the set, but which are going to be overruled by what's on the other half. So, in the set A, it says the set A has got some or all of the real numbers in, but I'm going to tell you a bit more about it in a minute. So, 
I figure the first bit is saying those real numbers with some property, and then you get what the property is they have to satisfy. Okay? So this says those real numbers x with the property that x is strictly less than 0. So A is a set of all real numbers x such that x is smaller than 0. In other words, A is a set of strictly negative real numbers. Um, I won't tell you what B is yet. B, uh, so I'll let you think about that one in a minute um, and see what you come up with. But it's a similar thing. This time it's going to be those integers n so that n over 2 is an integer. Okay? So the first bit is we're, only, we're going to be looking at some or all integers and then I'm going to have to tell you something about which integers we want. So the bit that comes after the colon tells you the integers we want are precisely those integers n so that n over 2 is also an integer. Okay, so that's what B is going to be, and I'm going to let you figure out what that is in a minute. Uh, C is slightly different. So this time, the X in R is on the right. And on the left, it says, we're going to look at the squares of some things. So we're going to consider all things you can get, which are squares of some X's. Which X's are we going to be squaring? We're only going to square those x's which are in R. We're going to square all of those and see what we get. And we're going to take the set of all of those. Now, the set of all squares of real numbers is exactly the set of non-negative real numbers. So, so by the time you've taken squares of everything that's a real number, you get most numbers twice, but that doesn't matter. Um, sets don't care about multiplicity. The sets only care about whether things are in them or not. Okay. So naught is in because naught is the square of naught, and all the positive real numbers are in for two reasons, because there's a square of their positive square root and there's a square of their negative square root, but they're definitely in, so you get all non-negative real numbers. So that's what C is. So the C is a set of all squares of real numbers. i.e. C is a set you can work it out, it's a set of non-negative real numbers. Okay, now uh, then D which I'm going to let you think about in a second, is the set of all x's where I'm going to tell you something about what x has to satisfy in a minute. Okay? So that could be all x's in everything, which is actually too much. You can't have the set of all x's in everything. That's not a set. Um, that's too big. It turns out that you can't have a set of all mathematical objects um, because uh, it's been proven that's not a set. Um, so uh, there's something called Russell's paradox, which messes you up. So... Uh, so I'm going to have to tell you enough about x to make sure what we get is actually a set. OK, the first thing is good. We say um, x has to be a real number. So that's good. So actually, I'm again saying it's those real numbers x with some other property. And the comma means, the comma here indicates that there's a list of different properties that x has to satisfy. And it has to satisfy them all. So x has to be a real number and x squared plus 1 must be naught. So you have to figure out what that set is. It may be some well-known set in disguise. And I want you to talk amongst yourselves for a little bit about B and D. I'll just give you a couple of minutes to think about that, then I'll see if anybody can tell me what the sets B and D are, but not yet. Okay? So just talk amongst each other and see if you can convince your neighbour what the sets B and D are. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so, is, uh, actually, we'll start with D. Is there uh, anybody who's willing to tell me what the set D is? Yes, over there. D is a D, the empty set. Because it's those real numbers with the property that x squared plus 1 is 0. But of course, for every real number, x squared is greater or equal to 0. By the time you add 1, it's, it's at least 1. So it can't be 0. Or whatever other reason. I mean, of course, uh, there are no real solutions to this quadratic. So um, D is the empty set. Okay? Again, that comma there is telling you that both conditions have to be satisfied. And in this case... They can't be, so there are no solutions, but you still get a set. The set D is a perfectly good set, but it's the empty set. It's just got nothing in it. But that's fine. Um, a solution set may well have no elements. When you're asked to find what's a solution set for some equations, you can sometimes be given an inconsistent set of equations where there aren't any solutions. You'll come across that in various other modules, situations where there are no solutions at all, in which case the solution set is the empty set, and that's no problem. Right, okay, now for B, there are various different descriptions. Anybody uh, want to give me a yes uh, there in the middle? So even numbers and zero, and that leads to the question, is zero even? Okay, um, so I would just say it's a set of all even integers because in this module, zero definitely counts as even. So if you go to a casino, they won't agree because if you bet on even at a casino and zero comes up, they won't give you any money. Um, but, uh, but in fact, for me, uh, the integers, and, and this is tip standard in mathematics, the even integers are the ones where when you divide by two, you get an integer. So I would just say B is the even integers, um, which include zero. Um, zero is still even. And that will fit the definition I'll give you later in the module for even. Um, so if you've got a definition for even that doesn't include zero, then that definition won't, be, won't agree with the definition we're using in this module. So B is a set of even integers. That includes zero. Uh, if you wanted you could write it in this way you'll have to use ellipses on both sides because it comes in to minus 4, minus 2, 0, 2, 4 and then it carries on again Okay. so this time we've got dot dot dots on both sides and you are allowed to have dot dot dots before as well as dot dot dots after um, so this indicates that the pattern continues backwards as well as forwards, and you can see what, and these are the even integers. So yes, for us, zero counts as even. Okay. So what else have we got? So I'm going to let you have a go at sketching these things, but let me first uh, tell you what they mean. So, in fact, maybe, maybe I'm just going to do it, because I, you, you probably haven't seen these before, um, or if you have, it's only been very recently. These are various different kinds of intervals of real numbers, and the different kinds of brackets used tell you whether or not the end point is included or excluded from the interval. So, roughly speaking, you get all the numbers between the two things mentioned, and then you have to decide whether the ones at the edge of the interval are in or out. If it's a square bracket, the number is in the interval, and if it's a round bracket, the number mentioned there at the end is not in the interval. So, when square brackets are both sides, it means that minus 1 and 0 are included in A, and so is everything in between. B, this tells you that this is, this is a set of numbers that are strictly between 1 and 2, because both of the brackets are round, means that 1 and 2 are not in the set. 
C is a mixed one. It's what's called a half-open interval. The square bracket next to the 3 tells you that 3 is in the set, but the round bracket next to the 4 tells you that 4 is not in the set. So it's the numbers between 3 and 4, including 3, but excluding 4. Notice it's sets of real numbers. It's not just integers, not just fractions. There's going to be loads of irrational numbers in there as well. There's no gaps. Um, you don't miss out anything between at all. So anything that's strictly between these numbers, any sort of number, any real number strictly between these numbers counts and is in. But you just have to look at the brackets to decide whether the endpoints are in or not. Um, here's the other kind of half-open interval, D. This time, it's the numbers between 5 and 6. 6 is included because of the square bracket. 5 is excluded because of the round bracket. And then there are unbounded intervals that could go up to plus infinity or to minus infinity. Um, since infinity and minus infinity are not real numbers, they can't be included. So you have to use round brackets. If you use in plus infinity or infinity, which is regarded as the same thing, um, or if you use minus infinity at the other end, you have to use a round bracket because they can't be included as a set in real numbers. When you get to fourth year, I start to use plus and minus infinity as objects. Um, and we have what's called the extended real line, where you have all the real numbers and plus infinity and minus infinity. But I don't do that till fourth year. So at the moment, um, we're working the real numbers. Um, plus infinity and minus infinity can't be included, so you have to use the round bracket. Um, so this one says everything between 7 and infinity, excluding infinity. So really that just says you have to be at least as big as 7, and the square bracket tells you 7 is included. So it's everything from 7 onwards here, and it, it doesn't stop. Right. Uh, so what I'll do is I will sketch those on the number line for you. Um, but first, let me just uh, give you at least one of them in words. Um, A is equal to x in R, such that minus 1 is less than equal to x, is less than equal to 0. Um, C is equal to those x in R, such that 3 is less than or equal to x, is strictly less than 4. Less than or equal because 3 is included because of the square bracket, but strictly less than 4 because 4 is excluded because of the round bracket. And now I can draw that for you on the number line. I can draw you all of these sets on the number line at the same time because I made sure they didn't touch or overlap. And um, there are various ways of showing that uh, the points are included or excluded. Um, one way to do it is to use a sort of solid spot or a non-solid spot, a solid dot or a non-solid dot, and that's what I'm going to use as the easiest way of doing it here. So first I'm going to draw the number line, which I'll do in black. And um, I could just draw an arrow to show it goes off, or I could put dot, dot, dot to show that the number line doesn't stop. It goes off. This is, the real, this is the real number line. It goes off in both directions as far as you like. Now, the smallest number mentioned in my list is minus 1. Uh, and I'm going to need a few ticks here, going up to 7 at least. So I'll have a few ticks. Well, uh, starting at my, so that's going to be minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Maybe I should have started a bit further over. Anyway, this will do. Minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Wish I made it a bit bigger. Um, you can make it bigger on your diagram. Now, let's have some colours. So, A, um, actually I'll do this with a slightly thicker one. So A goes between minus 1 and 0 inclusive and includes both endpoints. So I'll do a solid splodge at both ends to show that the endpoints are included. And I don't like the way that came out very well. But never mind, I, I think I'll use the, the thinner one next time.
So that's the set A. And the sort of solid splodges at each end indicate that uh, the point at the end is in. Um, B goes to be 1 and 2 exclusive, and I think it's better if I use a thinner line after all. So use a different colour for B. I'll use some sort of blue. Exclusive, so I'm going to do these spots that I don't fill in at the end points, 1 and 2, and then I get everything in between. So that's B. Let's have another colour. For C, C includes 3 but excludes 4. So I need a solid spot at 3 and an empty spot at 4 and I get everything in between. And it would have helped if I made it bigger. Anyway, there's C. D is the other way round. Again, have another colour. Um, this time, 5 is excluded from D, but 6 is included in D. And I get everything in between, so that's D. And E starts at 7 inclusive and goes off to infinity. And I'm, uh, I've got to go back to red for this one. Um, so 7 is included in E, and then E goes off to infinity... So I have to do, go all the way along. And E doesn't stop, so I'll do some dots for E as well. And that's E. OK. Um, any questions about intervals, uh, diagrams on the number line? If not, we'll pause and we'll start the workshop at 4 o'clock. OK? I'm going to stop the recording there.